Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. Alina's gone and found something a little bit different for us today. Alina, what have you found? I have gone and found you a major. He's still a major. Are you still a major at the moment? I think you say major retired. I'm avoiding all of that. I'm just going with Mr. these days. I think that works. That works rather okay. nicely. Okay. So we've got with us Mr. Andrew Fox. <laughs> who served in the British Army for 16 years, first in the Royal Welsh and then in the Parachute Regiment. He served on three tours of Afghanistan between 2007 and 2010 and one of Bosnia in 2018. He retired early this year as major and is now a PhD student and war studies lecturer at the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst. Hi, Andrew. Welcome on the podcast. We finally got you on the podcast. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I was, I was quite quite flattered. So I'm, I'm really grateful for, uh, for the invitation. God, what an overachiever, though. <laughs> He's making <laughs> us look bad. <laughs> I think of it more as being more as being just a closet nerd for 16 years, and now I can be in a, an oh, you're proud fully nerd. able. But no, before no, yeah. you go fully into nerddom and disappear down the war ball route with us, we do badges, by the way, uh, <laughs> we can talk to you about your time in Afghanistan and with the Royal Welsh and with the Paras, aren't we? Yeah, that's the plan, as I, as I understand it. Yeah, brilliant. He's like, at least doing I hope some, that's what we're going to talk about. Doing, <laughs> doing some oral history. For, we have not done oral history in a while, and I'm really looking forward to this. This is going to be good. Um, so let's start with the beginning, I guess, which that makes, <laughs> makes sense all around. In 2007, you were a platoon commander attached to the Mercians with the Royal Welsh. It was also your first tour of duty and you were sent to Afghanistan. Let's talk about this tour because you went there straight from training, didn't you? How did that happen? Yeah, I mean, the, the Herrick 6 rotation was on and it was, the, it was the very first time the army had pushed a full brigade out there, I think. Um, they'd given the paras the first shot who went kind of with three para battle group plus a bit of a brigade headquarters. So it's quite a, quite a small number of troops. And that winter, I know the Royal Marines had taken on their share of, of the work for, for a six-month rotation. And then they kind of realised it was going to be a, a much longer enduring campaign. And so they they sort of broadened it to the field army from rather than just the spearhead troops. Um, and the, this, was, this, was, this tour was kind of the first rotation that the, the sort of the remainder of the army had, had deployed on. Uh, and basically all of us who had units that were out there kind of got summoned into the OC's office, uh, the officer commanding, you know, who was running the, the training course at Brecon. Um, we were having quite a sedate time just learning how to plan ranges and stuff. Uh, you know, we'd done the hard bit by then. And, and they said, oh, yeah, all of you, you're off to Afghanistan. Best of luck kind of thing. Um, so that was kind of a shock. And then we went to do our pre-deployment training, which back then was, I think it was only a week. It was really, really short. And it was very kind of generic. It was very, very different to the kind of fully worked up pre-deployment training package you, you get in later tours. Um, you know, they were doing section attacks that were they were being done by Royal Engineer Bandsmen as demonstration troops. So you had these sort of non full time soldiers, you know, musicians showing us how to do section attacks and we'd all just finished our infantry training. It was kind of a little bit turned on its head. But yeah, I, I kind of my my company, my Royal Welsh company had just done six months out there. And I think my OC was keen for me to have a bit of experience and a bit of credibility with the blokes. So he, he kind of pulled strings with his brother who was over at Two Mercy and the commanding officer. And um suddenly I found myself in Kandahar. Um like two two tops, maybe three weeks out of training. It was, yeah, it was, it was pretty much every young platoon commander's dream. Actually, I tell that to the officer cadets I'm teaching at the moment, and um, and they all look quite jealous. You mentioned just now that people who are playing in the orchestra were basically training you. Did I mishear that, or am I just uh, going yeah. crazy? So they were the demonstration troops. So it's literally this is how you do a section attack, and it was down at Lid Camp on a sort of small patch of grass, probably no bigger than my garden. And you had eight, eight professional musicians demonstrating a section attack to a bunch of, of newly qualified professional infantrymen. Um, but it, was, it was just, yeah, quite surreal. Um, and kind of the officers there got around the, uh, the private soldiers straight away and just went, right, forget everything you've just seen for the last half an hour. That is not how it's done, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so talk us through the tour. Uh, you had, did you have to find your own way to Camp Bastion? Yeah, it was really random. So I turned up, we landed in Kandahar and, and, you know, the plane did that really cool descent and, you know, uh, you, you kind of, you're flying in normal and then all of a sudden the lights go out, you put your body armour and helmet on and, and the plane just drops, uh, you know, to try and avoid any anti-aircraft missiles and stuff. And you sort of, it's like a roller coaster where you then land and you get out of Kandahar and most people know what they're doing and where they're going. And I was sort of stood there in the uh, arrivals bit 
uh, with absolutely no idea where I was going and no one to meet me. So I had to find my way to kind of the Royal Welsh. So I had my Bergen, my grip, my day sack all kind of strapped onto my body. And I had to wander around Kandahar at two in the morning trying to find trying to find my unit, who then bundled me on a plane to Bastion the next day. I, I arrived in Camp Bastion after a little journey. And then again, nobody was really expecting me or anything. So they kind of, and then I had to uh, kind of find my own way to, to Camp Price, which is where the rest of the battle group were. So forward operating base Price is up in Goresk. And um, I happened to run into the, the Czech special operations group in the dinner hall who mentioned they were going to Price the next morning. And I kind of went, well, do you want if I jump in, please, lads? And they were like, yeah, sure. And they were these great, massive blokes with beards and bandanas. And um, yeah, they were quite rogue. Um, they, they were kind of a blend between special forces and sort of paramilitary police. Um, and yeah, they they drove around, and their method of their method of trying to find the IEDs was to send a bloke on a quad bike at the front of the convoy. <laughs> and if he went bang, then that was very unlucky. But it meant nobody <laughs> else. <laughs> yeah, it was it was completely random. And then I sort of rocked up at, at Price and found the battle group, and away we went. This is um, very well organised. It's just going in my head. Perfect organiser. Exactly what you want to be doing. Do you know what's hilarious, Alina, is this is all, you know, we interviewed Cam, who was a yeah. colonel in the RLC. Like, yeah. Basically, he should have been the one doing the organising, shouldn't he? So basically, blame him. <laughs> it's his fault that Andrew hasn't been able to get uh, to, to, to the camp correctly. It's all You know he'll fault. blame it on the RAF. Yeah, well, I'll drop him an email. I'll drop him an email and thank him. It's actually, it was really good fun. Yeah. I mean, you, you don't really often get to freestyle your way around a war zone. So, you know, it's kind of unusual experiences that, that kind of were a little bit different from the norm. And I quite, I quite enjoyed it, to be honest. So there's another thing you've mentioned. So, oh God, I still can't pronounce this to, to this day. And you're going to laugh at me. So it's operation. You're going to have to say this for me. Yeah, Palkwahel, which is um, hammer blow in Pashti. Okay, that's a much easier way. So op can I just call it Operation of Hammer Blow? Is that going to just be yeah. easier for me? Okay. Yeah, let's, go think, yeah. for let's, let's make it simple here. <laughs> make it simple and easy. So Operation Hammer Blow, talk us through that, because that was um, that was the moment you got to see some actual action. Yeah, and it was, you know, I, I, when I turned up at Price, they'd already done battle group orders for this and, and everything. So kind of I just zeroed my rifle and, got a quick back brief on the plan from from the, co the company commander I was working with and, and then away we went so we kind of leaguered up in the deserts um in the green zone uh overnight and then the next day the, the plan was to go into an area called the witch's hat um which is in sort of the the lower Goresh valley um and I think the paras and the marines had both sort of had quite a rough time there because they'd gone in quite small strength so the Mercians were going in full battle group mode um and actually it was the first ever action of the of the Mercian Regiment because they deployed on tour as the Worcester and Sherwood Foresters and they'd been amalgamated with the Staffords and the Cheshires halfway through the tour. So they'd done a cap badge change in Afghanistan. Um, and really it was it was kind of what we call combined arms. Uh, it, it was in action. It was, it was fascinating to watch from a kind of a new boy's perspective because, you know, we had fast air dropping 500 pounders. We had Apaches overhead. We had warriors giving fire support. We had Royal Marines in, in Viking um armoured fighting vehicles like with like kind of twin cab things with tracks uh you know they they kind of provided home bank protection and the royal engineers put in a, an infantry assault bridge uh and it was all very exciting if i'm honest uh you know it, it properly felt like you're in a in a war rather than a counterinsurgency campaign or anything like that you know they, they didn't pull anything in terms of the punch it was uh it was a real full-on kind of british army flexing its muscles um which i've never seen before or since if i'm honest so it was it was really interesting and, and, and like, tremendously exciting so talk to us about the canal that was in Taliban hands. Yeah, so the way the way the sort of the Helmand's kind of that part of Helmand goes is you've got the river and then either side you've got a bit of, uh, of greenery that they use, you know, the, the stuff, the, the bit of the land they can irrigate using the river. Uh, and then I think sometime in the 50s, the Americans paid for a big canal network uh, and that effectively gives you your kind of left and right of arc. If you think of the river flowing north to south and then you come a little bit east, you've got a canal uh, and in the middle of that is the green zone. Uh, so, you know, we went over that and the bridge was kind of shaky and we were taking quite a bit of fire, as I remember. Um, I ran over the bridge and I forgot that the, the drop on the other side was about six foot. So I, I came over the end of the bridge, fell six foot and lay there completely winded whilst pretty much everyone on the far side that had already crossed was turned and laughing at me. So that was quite 
quite entertaining. And then later in the day, the bridge actually collapsed with two blokes on it. Um, fortunately, they were both okay. And um, but it did require the the military divers to come out and get their and get their weapons back from the uh, from the riverbed. So, you know, it was quite a flimsy structure. Uh, but yeah, it was, you know, it was it was it was kind of sobering as well because it was all very exciting until until we dropped a 500 pounder and and unfortunately the taliban had been using human shields and uh, i believe a family was killed uh and you know as we went over the rubble of that you could see scraps of clothing and stuff and it was all it was all pretty it was kind of a a really fast step change from the excitement uh of kind of doing it all properly for real for the first time to kind of an immediate lesson in, in the human cost of collateral damage and things like that so it was it was kind of a, a really fast wake-up call and it was you know that day just went by on a blur um because uh, you know any one of those things would be enough to make you go this is crazy but to get you know all those things at the same time was was pretty kind of yeah it, i think head headwise it put you into a kind of almost shocked state because because it was so kind of so much overwhelming emotion coming your way in such a short space of time did you have light-hearted moments too? Uh, I mean, yeah. There's always there's always comedy things, you know. In in war, I mean, I, I was the I was the claymore guy because I was straight out of training, so uh, I was freshest on how to handle a claymore. And I, we did a, you know, we came into a compound and we were going to set up for the night. And I went out with a little fire team of, of of soldiers to to give me a bit of protection while I set the claymore up. And it's it's very it's it's not something you want to play around with because if, if you get it wrong and it goes bang, then you know that's you. Even if you're not in front of it, it's still gonna it's still gonna cause a bit of damage when it goes off. So you're, you're very carefully putting the fuses in, uh, you know, tightening the fuses up, um, having already made sure the, the detonation uh, clacker, as we call it, is, is working. And so this is all beautifully set up carefully. Our, our protection were there. I called uh, one lad Fred back towards me um, to start collapsing. The, the protection and he just walked backwards straight over the claymore tripped over it fell on top of me he crushed me <laughs> so we had we had half a second of, sort of looking at each other going holy shit is this going to go bang <laughs> and uh, fortunately it didn't and then it became a funny story rather than a really really awful one so oh. so you know that was that was kind of interesting but yeah you, you get all kinds of weird little things like that when you you mentioned the the taliban using human shield and that is I mean, it's awful in a physical and moral way, but also in a psychological way as well for you. It must have been awful to know that by engaging them, they would be willing to do that. Are they yeah. psychological in outlook like that? Do they do more stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, the very nature of their tactics are quite psychological because, you know, they, they have, you know, over a year now of, of losing to us in firefights. Yeah. you know mano a mano they didn't have the technology or the firepower to compete with us and so they 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 started putting ieds in the ground and you know the real just the threat of them alone if you can imagine patrolling knowing that there's a chance something might go bang under your foot and you know nothing about it you know that's the strain that places on you every time you leave base is is you know it's horrendous um and on my later tours i remember seeing you know lads from the rifles up in sangin when i was what's up there with the americans and i think we'll talk about that in a bit but you know these, these lads are thrown up with fear every time they left the base because they knew something was going to happen to them that that's kind of outside their control because in a firefight you've got control you know you can lay down a base of fire you know you've got machine guns you can call for and if it goes really really badly you can call for a fast air or you can call for an apache to, to back you up whereas when there's just this lurking death hidden in the ground just waiting for you to stumble over it you know that's a that's a profoundly straining experience um they used to do other things like they'd howl at night so they, they'd kind of creep up to the compounds we were in at night and howl like wolves um and it's just you know they were trying to psychologically intimidate you uh and the howling was kind of effective it was it was a bit spine chilling the first time you heard it because you know you didn't know what it was yeah um and it often presaged an attack as well. So, you know, they, they often, often quite gave away their element of surprise to try and gain an element of psychological advantage. Uh, That's what they do in so, uh, Greyhound, isn't it? The wolf pack, the, they're doing uh, yeah. submarines. Know, like yeah. That. yeah, no, it's very similar, very similar. Um, they, they kind of stopped doing it after a while. Uh, but I think also you've got to remember they'd just taken a big loss. I mean, we had taken all the area of ground that we wanted to. And so I guess they felt the need to try and re-establish some kind of some kind of dominance or some kind of at least score some points on the day. So you, you can see why they would do it. Um, but yeah, again, if they, if they launched a small arms attack on a, one of our compounds, they were never going to get anywhere because 
you know, we had all our machine guns up on the up on the sentry sentry towers and things like that. So, you know, it, I guess in, in, more than anything. Yeah, exactly. But you know, the, the, the tactics they turned to certainly were very effective. I think in um, in creating that psychological effect in in, in the British side of things. There's one thing we have forgotten to talk about, and it's something that you brought up when uh, when we were having our chat. Tell us, where were you living? So you kind of, on that operation, we had day sacks only, and I didn't see my Bergen the whole time I was out in the field. Um, so we'd moved from compound to compound. Um, and we ended up in this kind of, it was like the Afghan equivalent of Ludlow Castle, is all I can describe it as. Um, it was really, it was, it was really surreal for me because I grew up in Shropshire, which is obviously a, you know, a kind of, it was quite a pivotal county in the Middle Ages and there's castles everywhere and ruins all over the place. And, you know, we, we rocked up at this this fort in a place called Cardo Calle and it was, it was honestly, you know, it had towers, it had a guard robe, um, it, everything you'd associate with a British castle, it was there, except there was walls made of mud and an enormous field of cannabis next door, which kind of pumped out that odour every morning. So it was it was like a an Afghan mud castle for stoners. So I'd describe it, <laughs> but it was yeah, very very strange. Did you get the throne room? No, but we did make our own throne. We had pioneers with us, and instead of uh, the usual Afghan toilet facilities, they made this beautiful construction out of an oil barrel and uh, a tire to sit on for a toilet seat. So, you know, we had very much the best throne in in Afghanistan for for that period of time we were in there. It was quite, it's quite the luxury. I wasn't thinking of that kind of stuff. <laughs> I've not had enough dealing with talking to British soldiers. <laughs> Tell us about, because we, we heard a fair amount in the news and things about friendly fire, didn't we, um, during yeah. this campaign. Tell us about the Mercians and the anti-tank missile. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a sad thing and, you know, it is out there in the media, so I'm, I'm not going to yeah. name any names or, or any units, or, you know, subunits particularly, but we were giving fire support to the Danes who were on the other side of the river uh, in a compound called Alpha X-Ray. Um, and we were quite successful in, so that the river was what was termed a no fire line. Um, so for safety reasons, you know, you call it um, battle space architecture where you lay down things like you don't fire across this line so that you, you minimise your chance of hitting a friendly call sign. Mm -hmm. uh, but occasionally, occasionally we were able to get on the net when we had a really clear opportunity to to, to open fire. Um, and on one occasion, uh, one of the other companies slightly further around fired a javelin missile at um, a Taliban who were attacking the Danes. But we, we were sort of sat there with a with a ninety degree on view of this, and you could just see the missile going from right to left, uh, and you could see that it was going to overshoot, uh, and it ended up impacting the Danish compound, unfortunately. So we were kind of just sat there shocked and, and numb uh, and you know trying to find out what the hell had happened um and then of course the, the Kazakh tunic turns up and it's all incredibly tragic and awful um but it's so easy to do um and that's why they impose things like no fire lines um you know i don't know what the outcome of the inquest was and i've you know i've, I've kind of deliberately steered away from it because it was quite an upsetting thing uh, i know that the, the chain of command who were involved with that and the soldier who fired the missile would have had a very rough time off the back of that so um, but yeah, it was just, it was just one of those really sad, tragic things that happens in war. And, you know, bottom line is if you're going to throw around expensive missiles, you know, things are going to go wrong occasionally. And, you know, I've seen that a few times, you know, even with the 500 pounder, you know, at the start of the operation when, when the Afghan family was, was in the building when it hit, um, you know, you know, I'm teaching Clausewitz at the moment. He talks about friction uh, and sort of the chaos that's an inherent part of the character of warfare and, and this is just a classic example of that, really. It's just, you know, it, it, human beings make mistakes. Uh, and sometimes those mistakes have incredibly tragic outcomes. You didn't end up having to deal with any wounded on this tour, did you? I mean, we, will, no. we are going to come back to this at, a, at another point. But on this specific tour, you didn't have to deal with any of them. Uh, no, we were very lucky in, in my company. We didn't have any casualties on that one. We had uh, we had anniversaries of guys who'd been wounded earlier on the tour. Um, uh, and I know on, on Palco Hill, we did lose a couple uh, of, of our resupply guys who, who ended up in the canal in their vehicle, unfortunately. Um, but, but yeah, we were, we were really lucky. We, we didn't have, you know, we didn't have casualties for that one. So, so yeah, thank God for that. We, um, you did a second tour in summer 2008 where you were a platoon leader uh, slash 
Lieutenant. But um, we're going to move on to your third tour, which is winter 2009-10, where you were a liaison officer um, slash captain. So let's talk about this tour because it was um, this is the most interesting of them, wasn't it? So tell us about the US Army 7th Group. Yeah, I mean, I was really lucky. I was in, I was in um, a position where my Royal Welsh Company had been folded down. They were only going to deploy with two companies and mine was the one that got chopped. Uh, so they had a spare captain. So they sent me out ahead of the rest of the battle group to to be the liaison officer for the brigade in Lashkigar, which wasn't particularly exciting. And I was pretty underwhelmed because, you know, I was already suffering some PTSD effects at this point. And all I wanted to do was get back and get some adrenaline um, and, and, you know, carry on fighting, as it were. So I was, I was fairly underwhelmed by the job I'd been given. So I went out there. But then they put a delay on the Royal Welsh deploying. So they didn't deploy till Christmas time, I think. And I was already out there by September. And so Brigade needed someone to go off with the USSF, the Special Forces. Um, and I, as I was kind of like the, the spare bloke lying around with nothing to do, uh, it was right time, right place. And um, off I went to, to go in and bed with, with the Green Berets, um, which was really cool. Because, you know, I turned up and the first thing the company commander said to me was like, hey, man, you know, are you coming out on the ground with this? And I was like, I did not even know that was an option. Yes, yes, I am. Absolutely. Uh, so I was delighted and I got issued my American M4 carbine and it's sort of the, the, the cool radio, the m radio that they carry. And I got a, a quick training on that. And then basically my job was effectively pimping them out to, to the British. So I'd ring up uh, the, the ground holding battle groups. Uh, I'd bring up their intelligence officer. Hey, look, I've got an SF team here. Um, is there anyone that you want us to uh, to go and have a conversation with? And they'd they'd send me over the target packs and, you know, away we'd go. Um, we'd, we'd get our own... Uh, they had their own um, scan eagle, which was a kind of UAV. We do our own intelligence soak on the target. We could call on some other kind of cool assets to, to kind of get eyes on. Um, and then we'd jump in our helicopters with the Afghan National Army commandos that we were training, uh, go do the strike mission, um, see how that went. And then we'd, we'd come back for steak in the cookhouse and, and wait for the next target to come in. So it was a really, it was a really dynamic tour. And, you know, I had loads of really interesting work to do. And then I got to go on the missions as well. So um you know it was, it was it was definitely a military career high point for me i mean i've asked we've asked or we're going to ask i asked you previously um about mm. two of the missions so if we start with the first one so um this mission was in um kayaki sofla yeah kayaki sofla yeah that's right yeah talk us through this mission and what happened I mean, anyone who served in northern helmand will know that village it's it was renowned as a sort of a hotbed of unpleasantness um and it was a really interesting mission because it was against an IED facilitator. And when we when we took down the compound, it, the, the room um, that we that we found quite a bit of the, the, the IED components and stuff in, they'd whitewashed the inside wall, um, and they'd written up instructions on how to make IEDs on it. So they made a made made a whiteboard on the inside of the compound. But what was really interesting is that a lot of the instructions on there were in English. So that was kind of an interesting bit of intelligence. But yeah, that that mission turned quite cheeky. Um, we took a lot of incoming fire. We we ended up using some of the uh, assets in the sky. We had, you know, the, the Spectre gunship was was called in, and uh, you know, it was all fairly fairly kinetic. And um, uh, and we did take one, I think, three casualties total for that mission. But um, I was first aid given first aid to one of them. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, he didn't make it. One of the Afghans. Uh, you know, I finished that mission covered in blood, and it was so strange because I got back to Bastion, and my and my uniform was just you know written off from from the blood and i kind of got changed and sort of went to the cookhouse and saw the royal welsh lads who had now but by that time had deployed and you know it was, it was so weird having to just i didn't feel i could talk about it to them or, or or kind of share what i'd just done and there i was having having a meal with my mates as if nothing had happened and it was just the most weird disconnect was there a um, lot of um cooperation with afghans yeah so the green Berets are mentors so we had a um we had an ana uh, company of their commandos which is their sf and we were responsible for training them uh, and then taking them on the missions uh you know they planned themselves they were, they were very very effective at, at doing mission planning you know I, I saw stuff from them that was just as good as any british stuff i'd done they were really really quality quality unit to work with um the other mission aline is referring to is kandahar uh, and it involves a woman turning informer doesn't it yeah this was quite an unusual one so we um we kind of we landed on we we entered the compound and secured a bunch of people um 
And there was kind of a field within the compound. It was kind of a, a big double wall thing where, where they obviously grew some crops and we had the, the men separated and just on their knees and we were trying to work out who was who and who was you know friendly, who wasn't. And we found a room where all the, all the women in that compound had been kind of concentrated when they heard us coming in. And this this this, this Afghan old lady, this, she was sort of very wizened, sort of came out and was just like, bah, giving it, you know, shouting at the American commander in in in, uh, in Pashti. Um, got the translator over, and, and basically, she was saying that the Taliban had come there about three days previously, and they'd uh, effectively hold her, her and all her family hostage. Uh, at which point she promptly marched over to the field where all the men were being held and just went, he's Taliban, he's Taliban, that's my brother, he's Taliban, that's my nephew, and, and kind of just absolutely bubbled all of them to us. So, you know, it was, it was a good bit of human intelligence there. So obviously we nicked the ones that yeah. she identified and, uh, never and off we went. Never yeah. granny is the theme there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've never seen someone so angry and so keen to help us. It was, it was, um, it was definitely unusual. because you, you never, you know, Of course, you never really saw the, the women in Afghanistan because they were behind you know their their religious dress you, you get a, a flash of their eyes occasionally um but they, you, you very very seldom even talk to them because you didn't want to upset the uh you know the male uh, afghans that were there and they, they've got very strict rules about what women can and can't do so so that was one of the one times i've seen an afghan woman without her religious face covering on and um and yeah she was amazingly helpful so that was great um <clears throat> sorry i wanted to think i wanted to ask something because so far we've been talking about some pretty dark things um, on this tour. Yeah. I don't know about something positive that came with you on this tour, like something to do with the Americans. I mean, we lo- we love hearing American stories. Um, as like the one the, the the podcast Alex mentioned earlier that we did, the with the the, the kind of communication between the Americans was was amusing. Yeah, I mean, they, I think they found me an absolute curio because whilst I was technically a captain, I wasn't in their chain of command. They, they found my accent most entertaining and they, they, they nicknamed me Nigel because apparently all British men are called Nigel. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether, I think they've watched Spinal Tap one too many times maybe. Um, but they, they used to kind of like showing off a little bit. So when we were in Kandahar, they, uh, some of the Green Berets were, were getting up to mischief with some of the American logistics girls and they had a, uh, I think one of one of the Green Berets had kid coupled up with a with one of his fellow soldiers, and he was taking his mate on a double date to meet her friend to see if they got along just as well. And for some reason, I'll never know. Is they they took me along as well as a kind of observer. So we're in the Dutch cafe in in Kandahar, and you know the small talk starting, and so the, the, the Green Beret guy is asking this girl questions. And he's like, you know, he goes, uh, so what do you do? And she said, like, oh, nothing. You know, I just deliver stuff. I'm in logistics. It's all very boring. And he goes, and he, he put on this ridiculous voice, and he was like, "You know what? I deliver stuff too." And then he paused and looked down, and looked up again. And he goes, "Dead bodies." And honestly, it was the most cheesy oh thing I've god. ever heard in my oh life. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, tell me she did not buy that. Oh, she did. She totally went for it. Oh my <laughs> god. god. But but on the flip side, I was at the end of this under the table having to bite my knuckles, <laughs> not to wet myself laughing. So um, yeah, it gave me a good laugh anyway. So um, but yeah, yeah, absolutely stinking chat. You have mentioned a couple of times already your PTSD, and it's something that you feel really passionate about talking about and helping other military personnel that are in the same position as you. Um, I think the incident where you lost that guy, um, you were telling us about sort of cemented your mental state um you didn't follow procedure in decompression did you what was camp bloodhound and what was it for so that's that's why usually where you go through um in cyprus so you normally go and decompress for a, i think it's nearly a week I mean, i've never done it so i can't just say exactly from first hand how many days it is but i think it's about five days to a week where you basically drink beer and do water sports and hang out with your mates that you've just been you know in in the shit with for six months uh, and it kind of just gets that out of the system um before you then return to your family life because the americans i think have discovered you know i had um, american friends who'd be back with their families within 24 hours of being on a mission in, in afghanistan which you know you can imagine that jerk of being pulled out of a war zone and um you know ending up suddenly back in domestic life when you've been away for six months to a year you know that's quite a uh, quite a jolt to, to the to the psyche as it were um but because on, on all my three tours we were kind of i was kind of 
with other units other than my own and I, I never really ended up going through decompression so when I landed with the Mercians after my first tour they kind of went left to, to, to decompress and I just went back to the officers mess in Cyprus where my unit were based um, and I ended up at Paff in Paphos at like four in the morning naked in a bush um, with a bottle of vodka <laughs> in my hand um, which, which is certainly not the most healthy and well recommended way to get over being in a war zone um, second tour I don't think we did anything and then third tour again because I wasn't serving with the unit I, I left it a couple of weeks before then uh you know before the rest of them and so i ended up again just skipping decompression completely which you know in hindsight that put me at quite high risk but you know it wasn't as well known about or as talked about as it is now so the fact that i had a number of kind of high risk factors um didn't really occur to me or, or anyone else frankly i mean we are going to talk about ptsd a bit more um, because it does involve uh, one of the questions at the end. But before we move on to that, I want to talk about uh, becoming a paratrooper because you switched from becoming infantry to becoming a paratrooper in 2013. I mean, I'm really interested in how, how it was going from being a light infantryman to airborne infantry. So why did you switch and how did you go through this training process? So I'd seen the paras on Herrick 8 in summer 2008. Um, you know, they, three para were, were kind of the region battle group. So they'd rock up in your area of operations, do, do an operation and then go off somewhere else. Um, and I was, you know, I was impressed by seeing them and, and by the way that brigade worked. Uh, and then I got posted into 16 Air Assault Brigade as a captain um, in 2011. So I'd done two years in the brigade and I just really liked it. I love the ethos, that kind of the airborne ethos where, you know, you're encouraged to be independent you're encouraged to have those incredibly high standards and, you know, all that sort of thing really appealed to me. And also working with the para battalions, you know, I really liked their soldiers. And not that I didn't like the Royal Welsh ones, but, you know, the para ones were, you know, they were a cut of they were fitter, they were more determined, they were kind of a lot more cheeky and a lot more independent thinking. And, then, you know, they had that pride of, in their beret and their wings and it was just something that really appealed to me. And so as I left that staff posting in 16 Brigade, I put my transfer paper in and they kind of knew me as well. So, my boss, my, my two bosses, the brigade commander and the, the deputy commander were both, both power reds. And, you know, they obviously had written me a fairly decent report and, and the, the transfer process was pretty slick. Um, you know, I'd, I'd also done P Company, which is the airborne selection. Um, and I was pretty old at this point. I was 33, which meant competing with 18, 19 year olds on very fast runs was was quite, quite emotional. Um, you know, the first mile on the first day of P Company is run at five minutes, 45 seconds pace, which is you're basically sprinting for a mile. Um, and then you have a pain station where you do all kinds of calisthenics <laughs> and then you sprint that mile again and you do that another six times, I think. So, you know, that's just day one. Um, I'll get whereas, that. you know, yeah, whereas the, <laughs> the 18, 19 year olds would have a cigarette and a Mars bar and they'd be good to go. I was having ice baths and my compression tights with, <laughs> you know, foam rolling every night. You know, So um, I definitely felt it. You know, I could feel my energy levels depleting rather more than the 18, 19 year olds did. But, you know, past everything. So. Um, got around it and um, yeah next thing you know I'm jumping out of aircraft and being a company commander in a parachute battalion which was which was absolutely fantastic. I have so much respect for you for doing that I mean competing against these what we can call them kids because they are kids at the end mm. of the day and you did that at the age of 33 I mean Alex and I are slightly touch a little bit older than that and I don't think I could do that try and compete with with, with kids at the age of 19 so respect i'll watch you uh, do I don't know, drink uh, and tell yeah. you that <laughs> oh, we can out drink you know, them uh, we can out drink them but out running and out pacing forget it i'm gone i'm like an old person <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, but you know i was also six years into my military career and you, you do develop a, a kind of mental toughness from you know, you know a bit of mental resilience and a lot of that course is mental where you just keep going uh, I even think when you're that's tired what you knew when you took it on, right? You knew it was going to be like yeah. that. You were mentally ready to be absolutely bollocks. Yeah, and I was well prepared. You know, I was my my, my brigade deputy commander, Andy Jackson, was an absolutely brilliant bloke, uh, and he, you know, he made sure that I was in a good place before I went. Um, you know, he got me to do a two miler with him. I beat him, so he was like, he was happy that I could uh, I could pass B company if I could beat him. He was like, yeah, that's good enough for me. So, you know, I'm, I, I, I think it's a theme in your army career is that you don't often go to things like that where you're not prepared because generally people are good and look after 
look after people they know that are going forward with such things. So, you know, if I've had, you know, when I've been a commander, I've had lads going into selection. I've made sure they've had the time to train. Um, you know, it's, it, the army is good at looking after people. Um, it gets slated a lot. And I think the negativity gets amplified and the positivity gets overlooked. But, you know, the army does lots of things that I would have changed, uh, but they also do loads of stuff really well. And I, I don't think that's emphasised enough. Let's talk about, um, you talk about mental toughness and you talk about this kind of suck it up attitude. Um, you challenged that a bit about a year ago and you really got hammered for it, didn't you? Uh, yeah, a little bit. It was all fairly blown out of proportion in some ways, but it, it was a very unpleasant experience to go through. On so, Twitter? So, you know, the Never. No one ever yeah, I know. <laughs> It's an idyllic place, Twitter, you know. Everybody loves each other, holds hands, gives each other flowers and sing songs, apparently. Yeah. I mean, the context was I was in a really rough place anyway, so I was, I was pretty much falling apart at the seams before it even happened because it was the 10th anniversary of, of the Afghan who, who died on pretty much as I was trying to help him out. And, uh, and you know, I'd had not a very good New Year's Eve on the 10th anniversary of that, where I, I kind of woke up at six in the morning with a kind of empty bottle of whiskey and, and kind of a load of Christmas presents that I'd stacked up that I'd then fallen over and passed out. And, you know, I was, I was in, in the midst of being um, permanently downgraded at work. And then my dog died, so literally the day before. So I was in a really bad place about that. And then the context is my, my, my girlfriend at the time had, um, she'd been a fighter, uh, you know, professional MMA fighter. And so I'd taken a fairly deep interest in head injury because it was starting to be talked about quite often in the papers. And, you know, you get footballers from the 60s and 70s who are getting really early dementia problems from heading the football. Um, you know, there's a currently a, a case against the Rugby Football Union by a bunch of rugby players who, you know, I, I, can't, I think it's Jason Lennon, I can't remember which player it is, but he said he can't remember winning winning the World Cup in 2003. It might be Woodcock, actually. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But the, the point is that these repetitive head injuries are now proven to uh, to cause really long, long-term long lasting damage. Um, you know, the, 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 the kind of most famous one being the Hernandez documentary on on Netflix about the American footballer whose brain was effectively Swiss cheese when they did an autopsy on him. Um, and the P company training staff posted, posted a video of milling, which is where you stand toe to toe with somebody else, uh, punch them in the face for 60 seconds uh, to see if they can take it and see if you can take it. And I suggested that perhaps in the light of recent medical evidence, it wasn't a great idea anymore. Uh, and we should probably leave it behind in the 1940s. Um, and that went nuclear for some reason. People, people took it really personally, um, uh, as if I'd somehow taken a taken a turd on regimental tradition. Um, when you know, perhaps all I was saying was that if our soldiers' brains are, are their greatest asset, then perhaps we should find another way to test that resilience. Um, and I, I pretty much stand by that because all the evidence that comes out in, in drips and drabs now is, is supportive of the fact that even sub-concussive head impact can cause mental damage. So they had an experiment where they had all this heading a football for 10 minutes. Now, modern footballs aren't a patch on what they used to be in the 50s and 60s. They're not leather anymore. They don't get soaked wet and become heavy. But even 10 minutes of just heading a football, these footballers showed cognitive decline. Uh, and that's not even a, you know, a concussive blow. Whereas if you're getting punched in the face for 60 seconds, that can't be a good thing. And I've since been contacted by people who said they've had you know, bleeds on the brain after it. Uh, I don't think it's many people. Uh, I think the risk is relatively low. Uh, but I was hoping to start a discussion about head injuries and mental illness, but it just turned into this <laughs> Twitter shitstorm. Yeah. Um, which I didn't, and because, because I wasn't in a great place, I could have escalated it myself by yeah. telling people to well, basically just putting out a tweet saying, right, you can fuck off, I don't care. <laughs> um, and, then that made, and then that made it into the Daily Mail and then our hours oh. of fun were had. So yeah, it was all a bit of a shit show, but I, I stand by my, my basic premise and my basic point, which was that head injuries are bad. Uh, yeah. We should probably we should probably avoid deliberately having head impact for our soldiers where we possibly can, um, and that's from a place a place of actually caring about soldiers rather than trying to be utterly disrespectful to yeah. however many years of, of regimental history. I um, it's not just head injuries though, is it? I mean, we it's so romanticised the idea of parachute troops now because of Band of Brothers and things like that. Um, but there are severe implications for paratroopers in later years, aren't there? Well, there can be. I mean. You know, the army is physical generally. Mm. Um, you know, I've I've always been a bit injury prone, and you know, uh, the worst injury I've had was a slip disc from a parachute jump. But that was kind of my own fault because I, I made an ass of my landing, quite literally, by landing on my ass, which which is absolutely not the recommended method. Um, 
And yeah, you know, you do get dodgy knees and dodgy backs, and but that's that's kind of common to most people who've been in the infantry, I'd imagine. I don't think it's necessarily specifically parachuting, because um, um, I think you know parachuting is a useful capability. Sign up, sign up to put your body, you know, right to and including chance you might get killed if you go on operations. And so, you know, there there has to be an element of accepting that things are going to take their toll on you um, because the human body's not designed to put a 60 pound pack on and and kind of run up and down mountains you know you're you're going to have dramas with that and um i did see an article in the wave room recently i think it was a repost from 2017 where they made the point that you know a lot of injuries happen to soldiers because of these kind of attritional bits of fizz that we do and that's something that we should minimize as well um but you know my, my, my sort of corollary to that was if we're going to minimize attritional injuries to joints we should probably try and minimize attrition attritional injuries to the brain as well i'm just going to throw in something personal here Actually, andrew knows this already um and alex does but um my uncle's a former power trooper a uh, power trooper paratrooper oh, god i can't even speak today um <laughs> and he's he's in his he's in his 60s god forbid he's listening to this and he's gonna go stop revealing my age to people um <laughs> He's in his 60s, uh, former medic, um, American American forces. And I'm sorry to say, but he is practically falling apart. I mean, he's, he's a medic. So not only is he carrying his own pack and everything else, but on top of that medical equipment, um, as many of his friends, you know, they're having to get spinal fusions and neck fusions and, and hip replacements and knee replacements and, and everything else. These men are sacrificing so much you know, for the, for freedom, for the army, and then in a later age, they're sacrificing their bodies. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, I, I'd do it again. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it was worth it. You know, I've, yeah, I've had a couple of ankle reconstructions um, and I've, I've had a hernia surgery and I've had a slip disc, but, you know, that bit. It's like if you favorite, ask an I've, astronaut, isn't it? Do, your bones yeah. going to look like an 80-year-old, but you get to go into space. They'll do it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? Some of the best moments of my life, you know, I've I've jumped out of Blackhawks over the Middle East doing free fall. I've, I've jumped out of Chinooks over in Fort Bragg and I did the, um, the 82nd Airborne's divisional jump um, when we were out there. And, you know, that stuff I'll remember for the rest of my life and, you know, something that was really cool. And I'd earned my place to be there, so it was quite special. Uh, and I was in command at the time, so it had a double significance. And, and you know, when I'm 70 or sat in my rocking chair, that's the kind of stuff I'll remember. And if I've got a bit of a sore back then, you know, I'll, I'll probably I'll probably still think that it was worth it. It's something that I really want to do is jump out of a plane, but there's only one condition that I do it, um, which means I have to fly to America and my uncle has to, obviously he can't jump out of, out of a plane now, but he has to go with me and I want him there on the ground because I think that's such a, a intimate bonding thing between the two of us where yeah. I get to experience it with him, even though he, however much I'd love to be able to do it with him, like physically, I can't. But for me, I think that that would be an awesome experience. No, I totally get that. And, you know, my dad and I, we, we both said, my dad retired like two weeks ago at the age of 70 as an RAF reservist, but he had a, a full-time career as a helicopter pilot in the Navy and the Air Force before he kind of left full-time service to be a reservist and you know we wear our uniform if, together if we have the opportunity in the past uh because it is a nice thing that brings you together you know my grandfather was u.s army as well um and i always took great pride in wearing my american rings and my combat infantry badge to sort of in his memory so yeah you know these things are really lovely i reckon that's something you should do 100 percent. get it done no excuses now you've promised it on tape <laughs> oh dear alex are you coming with me Fuck it, why not? And um, <laughs> Andrew, what's next for you? So I'm looking uh, at trying to get my job at Sanders made full time, which would be awesome. Um, I really enjoy it, and actually, you know, it's um it's a great way to kind of have a connection to the military and use some of my experience whilst using the academic knowledge that I'm now accruing as a PhD. Uh, so that's the plan at the moment. Um, Oh, and I'm also volunteering to be a, an army cadet instructor because I, I quite like to give a bit back if I possibly could. So, and that seems like a really good way to do it because um, I, I started off in the cadets. Um, I think they probably put me on the path to to where I am today. So, you know, if I, if I could give a bit back that way, then that'd be awesome. 
Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. I, I love this. Uh, I think it's been absolutely amazing listening to your experiences and especially being able to openly talk about PTSD because that is so important to be able to try and help any, anyone who is listening right now who is struggling and who is having any problems resolving from PTSD or physical or anything, please get in contact with uh, with an appropriate charity. Uh, Andrew, what would you recommend? Where would you recommend these people go? Well, in a crisis, the Samaritans are a really good place to start because although it's just someone at the other end of the phone to listen to you, you know, sometimes just talking about it can be enough to take the edge off, you know, a, a really, really dark day where you might then go on and do something something awful if you if you keep internalizing it so talk about it is the first thing to do um combat stress are pretty good um but if you're in the military i, I would i would say just put your hand up and go to the, the regimental medical officer they don't ask you any questions they'll refer you straight away to the, the, the mental health team uh, and then you can really get the proper help you need and i would say that the army dcmh the mental health team are incredible like you know i i, I do wonder if i would have been here today still if 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 I hadn't had the help I'd received from them, and they're, they're absolute angels. And I, I can't stress how much uh, and how supportive that they are. Uh, the treatment you get is first rate, uh, and they will look after you. So, But it's all about taking that first step and recognising that something's wrong. And that's often the hardest part, because you're walking around angry, you're walking around you know, with built-up tension and nightmares and, uh, and feeling hopelessness, and there's probably almost certainly some kind of alcohol abuse or gambling or sex you know, addiction or something like that in there as well. And you just don't realise that these are all symptoms of something deeper. So identifying that something's wrong, asking for help is the first, most hardest and most important step. And if you if you are able to do that, then, then the help that you need is there. And that's the bit that I would just kind of drum beat till, till my dying breath, because it's so important to, to try and make sure that people who need help get it. I would chuck in Veterans in Action as well, because um, it's run by veterans with PSD. They're only little, but... Um... They're like, they will go and knock on someone's door every day if they've got the capability of um, if someone needs help and to make sure they're all right. So them too. Cool. Great stuff. Thank you so much. My pleasure. No, I've really enjoyed it. It's been, um, it's been good. And thank you for listening to me chops off for, for the best part of an hour. I appreciate that. And I've since been contacted by people who said they've had, you know, bleeds on the brain after it. Uh, I don't think it's many people. Uh, I think the risk is relatively low. Uh, but I was hoping to start a discussion about head injuries and mental illness, but it just turned into this <laughs> Twitter shitstorm. Yeah. Um, which I didn't, and because, because I wasn't in a great place, I could have escalated it myself by yeah. telling people to well, basically just putting out a tweet saying, right, you can all fuck off, I don't care. <laughs> um, and, then that made, and then that made it into the Daily Mail and then uh, hours oh. of fun I had. So yeah, it was all a bit of a shit show, but I, I stand by my my basic premise and my basic point which was that head injuries are bad uh yeah. we should probably we should probably avoid deliberately having head impact for our soldiers where we possibly can um and that's from a place a place of actually caring about soldiers rather than trying to be utterly disrespectful to yeah however many years of, of regimental history i am um, it's not just head injuries though is it I mean, we it's so romanticized the idea of parachute troops now because of band of brothers and things like that um but there are severe implications for paratroopers in later years aren't there well there can be i mean you know the army is physical generally mm. um you know i've i've always been a bit injury prone and you know uh, the worst injury i've had was a slip disc from a parachute jump but that was kind of my own fault because I made an arse of my landing, quite literally, by landing on my arse, which, which is absolutely not the recommended method. Um, and yeah, you know, you do get dodgy knees and dodgy backs, and but that's that's kind of common to most people who've been in the infantry, I'd imagine. I don't think it's necessarily specifically parachuting. Because um, um, I think, you know, parachuting is a useful capability. Sign up, sign up to put your body, you know, rock to land, including chance you might get killed if you go on operations and so you know there, there has to be an element of accepting that things are going to take their toll on you um, because the human body's not designed to put a 60 pound pack on and and kind of run up and down mountains you know you're you're, you're going to have dramas with that and um i did see an article in the wave room recently i think it was a repost from 2017 where they made the point that you know a lot of injuries happen to soldiers because of these kind of attritional bits of fizz that we do and that's something that we should minimize as well um but, you know, my, my, my sort of corollary to that was if we're going to minimise 
attritional injuries to joints, we should probably try and minimise attrition, attritional injuries to the brain as well. I'm just going to throw in something personal here. Actually, Andrew knows this already, um, and Alex does, but um, my uncle's a former power trooper. Uh, power trooper? Paratrooper. Oh, God, I can't even speak today. Um, <laughs> And he's he's in his he's in his sixties. God forbid he's listening to this, and he's going to go stop revealing my age to people. Um, <laughs> he's in his sixties, uh, former medic, um, American American forces, and I'm sorry to say, but he is practically falling apart. I mean, he's he's a medic, so not only is he carrying his own pack and everything else, but on top of that, medical equipment. Um, as many of his friends, you know, they're having to get spinal fusions and neck fusions and, and hip replacements and knee replacements and, and everything else. These men are sacrificing so much, you know, for, for freedom, for the army. And then in a later age, they're sacrificing their bodies. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, I, I'd do it again. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it was worth it. You know, I've, yeah, I've had a couple of ankle reconstructions Um and I've, I've had a hernia surgery and I've had a slip disc, but you know, that bit. It's like if you ask remember, an astronaut, I, isn't it? Do, your bones yeah. are going to look like an 80 year old, but you get to go into space. They'll do it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? Some of the best moments of my life, you know, I've, I've jumped out of Blackhawks over the Middle East doing free fall. I've, I've jumped out of Chinooks over in Fort Bragg and I've did the, um, the 82nd Airborne's divisional jump um, when we were out there. And, you know, that stuff I'll remember for the rest of my life and you know something that was really cool and I'd earned my place to be there so it was quite special uh, and I was in command at the time so you had a double significance and, and you know when I'm 70 or sat in my rocking chair that's the kind of stuff I'll remember and if I've got a bit of a sore back then you know I'll, I'll probably I'll probably still think that it was worth it. It's something that I really want to do is jump out of a plane but there's only one condition that I do it um, which means I have to fly to America and my uncle has to obviously can't jump out of, out of a plane now, but he has to go with me and I want him there on the ground because I think that's such a, a intimate bonding thing between the two of us where yeah. I get to experience it with him, even though he, however much I'd love to be able to do it with him, like physically, I can't. But for me, I think that that would be an awesome experience. No, I totally get that. And, you know, my dad's, and I, we, we both served. My dad retired like two weeks ago at the age of 70 as an RAF reservist, but he had a, a full-time career as a helicopter pilot in the Navy and the Air Force before he kind of left full-time service to be a reservist. And, you know, we wear our uniform if, together if we have the opportunity in the past, uh, because it is a nice thing that brings you together. You know, my grandfather was US Army as well. Um, and I always took great pride in wearing my American rings and my combat infantry badge to sort of fit in his memory. So... Yeah, you know, these things are really lovely. I reckon that's something you should do, 100%. Get it done. No excuses now. You've promised to do it on tape. <laughs> oh, dear. Alex, are you coming with me? Fuck it, why not? Um, <laughs> Andrew, what's next for you? So I'm looking uh trying to get my job at Sanders made full-time, which would be awesome. Um, I really enjoy it. And actually, you know, it's... um it's a great way to kind of have a connection to the military and use some of my experience whilst using the academic knowledge that I'm now accruing as a PhD. Uh, so that's the plan at the moment. Oh, and I'm also volunteering to be a, an army cadet instructor because I, I quite like to give a bit back if I possibly could. So, and that seems like a really good way to do it. Um, Cause I, I started off in the cadets. Um, I think they probably put me on the path to, to where I am today. So, you know, if I, if I could give a bit back that way, then that'd be awesome. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. I, I love this. Uh, I think it's been absolutely amazing listening to your experiences and especially being able to openly talk about PTSD because that is so important to be able to try and help any, anyone who is listening right now who is struggling and who is having any problems resolving from PTSD or physical or anything, please get in contact with uh, with an appropriate charity. Uh, Andrew, what would you recommend? Where would you recommend these people go? Well, in a crisis, the Samaritans are a really good place to start because although it's just someone at the other end of the phone to listen to you, you know, sometimes just talking about it can be enough to take the edge off, you know, a, a really, really dark day where you might then go on and do something something awful if you if you keep internalizing it so talk about it it's the first thing to do um combat stress are pretty good um but if you're in the military I, I would i would say just put your hand up and go to the 
the regiment or medical officer. They don't ask you any questions. They'll refer you straight away to the, the, the mental health team. Uh, and then you can really get the proper help you need. And I would say that the Army DCMH, the mental health team, are incredible. Like, you know, I, I, I do wonder if I would have been here today still if, if, if I hadn't had the help I'd received from them. And they're, they're absolute angels. And I, I can't stress how much uh, and how supportive that they are. Uh, the treatment you get is first rate. Uh, and they will look after you. So, But it's all about taking that first step and recognising that something's wrong. And that's often the hardest part because you're walking around angry. You're walking around, you know, with built up tension and nightmares and uh, and feeling hopelessness. And there's probably almost certainly some kind of alcohol abuse or gambling or sex you know, addiction or something like that in there as well. And you just don't realise that these are all symptoms of something deeper. So identifying that something's wrong, asking for help is the first, most hardest and most important step. And if you if you are able to do that, then, then the help that you need is there. And that's the bit that I would just kind of drum beat till till my dying breath because it's so important to to try and make sure that people who need help get it. Thank you so much. My pleasure. No, I've really enjoyed it. It's been um, it's been good. And thank you for listening to me chops off for for the best part of an hour. I appreciate that. You can help us at History Hack by joining us via Patreon. It takes quite a lot of effort and a lot of work of quite a big team now to keep us going. And so if you could donate as little as £3 a month, it would be massively appreciated by all of us. There's different levels because Princess Marcus has set it all up with uh, varying rewards and things. So do have a look. Do join us. There's uh, an exclusive Facebook group as well and you can be part of all of it. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash hack history or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great book.